Hello, everybody, and welcome to Iceberg to Go, your daily dose of Pittsburgh Penguins news and analysis. You can find us on YouTube at Inside the Penguins or anywhere you get your podcast from. Let's face facts. The Penguins had many, many flaws last season, and it led to a turbulent season, whether it be the Penguins power play being inept throughout the majority of the year, whether it be the ups and downs of their star players and Eric Carlson and Evgeny Malkin, whether it be, you know, the, the lack of depth scoring as they tried to do the top six scores, the bottom six defends method early in the season and it not work out, whether it be Ryan Graves' struggles, whether it be trying to figure out that third pairing and the rotating door between P.O. Joseph and Chad Ruedel and Ryan Shea and John Ludwig until they finally found some stability late in the season with Jack St. Ivany and Ryan Shea. There were a lot of issues for the Penguins. And I think we can all agree that what they looked like this past season was far from a Stanley Cup contender. And if you made a checklist about what you needed to win a Stanley Cup, that the Penguins would be very far off. But what's interesting is the Athletics' Shayna Goldman shared her Stanley Cup checklist and how the teams that missed out on the playoffs this year stacked up to Stanley Cup champions between 2010, the Chicago Blackhawks, and 2023, the Vegas Golden Knights. She discussed the key ingredients of cup contenders over the past almost decade and a half and how those non-playoff teams like the Penguins stacked up in, in those ingredients and how they looked after this season, how they could project to look going into next season. And those ingredients included this, an elite first-line center that's among the very best players in the world, an elite first-line winger to support the elite center, two other top-line wingers on each of the top two lines, top-line center to play behind an elite center, two more top six forwards for depth in the middle six, an elite number one defenseman, a second number one defenseman to play behind him, a top pairing defenseman to help anchor a strong second pair with the number two, another top caliber defender to crush soft minutes on the third pair, and a top 10 caliber starting goaltender. Those were all the key ingredients, according to Shayna Goldman of The Athletic, to be a cup contender in today's game. And all are labeled on her article, from exceeding necessary game score value added to falling below the range entirely. There were four classifications that really identified where each player was. And I have the graphic up here from theathletic.com. And when you look at it, yeah, technically the Penguins don't have a horrible outlook as far as teams that were on the outside looking in this season. Sidney Crosby going into next year is considered to be above average. Eric Carlson is considered to be that elite defenseman. He's considered to be a top-tier guy going into next season. Tristan Jari, the goaltender, is below average but feasible in that position. The only three positions going into next season that seemingly, according to Goldman, are not up to par and need to be improved upon are the wingers. Brian Rust is not passable as that elite winger to support your elite center. Michael Bunting is not passable to be that second-tier top-line winger. And Drew O'Connor, according to her, is not passable to be a top-six forward, somebody that can bounce between the top and the bottom. And again, these are based on uh, statistic game score value added that the Athletic uses for a lot of different instances. But in her analysis later in the article, Goldman references the Penguins' need to acquire a top winger this summer, saying, quote, Knocking each of those forwards down a slot would make a huge difference. And if we go back to that, it means knocking Brian Rust from elite winger down to top line winger. That would put him in more of a passable category. In fact, could be above average to passable. Michael Bunting would be in the same situation in that third tier. And Drew O'Connor would be knocked out of that entirely as a a supporting cast role member for the Penguins. So that's what she says is the biggest need. And it's interesting to me because going into this offseason, when we talked about biggest needs, the first thing that shot up to my mind is they need to solidify the goaltending situation. Second thing on my mind was they need to figure out the defense. 
But adding a top line winger, a star winger to support Sidney Crosby being their top need is something that I don't think I really thought of simply because I have a lot of faith in Brian Rust and more so than that model suggests. I think Brian Rust certainly should have had 30 goals this season if he could have stayed healthy. He could have had 30 goals if he stayed healthy. But let's run with Shayna's method here, saying that the Penguins need to bring in a top line winger so everybody else can be knocked down a peg because there is a lot of sense to be made from that discussion because, you know, Drew O'Connor was fine as a top six role player this year. Brian Rust is fine being a top line player. Michael Bunting is fine to above average in my eyes as Evgeny Malkin's winger on the left side. But if you can knock everybody down a peg, you're always better. So let's look at who could be on the market this summer that would fit that role that would bump those players down and help the Penguins check off a couple more of those notches on the Stanley Cup contenders checklist. Penguins enter this offseason with $12.9 million in cap space. And it has to be mentioned that when Shayna was discussing this, she was discussing it as the Penguins running back a majority of their lineup, which is another thing that we'll get to here in just a minute. But when you look at the free agents this summer that could fit that top line winger mold that the Penguins would probably have to spend a lot of their $12.9 million in cap space on, free agent wise, it's guys like Sam Reinhart currently on the Florida Panthers coming off of a career season. It's going to be a very expensive deal, but he certainly would fit the mold when you look at how he would fit in the Penguins and what he would do to the remainder of the roster. Jake Gensel is obviously another name. I think as time passes, we all know that that is becoming less and less likely. It's not a 0% chance, but again, very unlikely at this stage of the game, considering they had how much time to negotiate a contract and seemingly got very didn't get very far in that aspect. But another name that's on the open market, older gentleman, Steven Stamkos, proven winner, captain of the Tampa Bay Lightning for the past decade, plus two-time Stanley Cup champion, and still a very dangerous player, specifically on the left half wall on the power play. Penguins' biggest hole on the power play since Phil Kessel left in 2019. So a lot of interesting names on the free agent market. There's some interesting names in the trade market that would fit that mold as well. Mitch Marner is one that has been talked about countless times by my co-host Nick Horwat and really by everybody since the Toronto Maple Leaf season ended. I've mentioned Trevor Zegras. I think he would fit into that mold slotting above Brian Rust when it comes to that particular statistic. And Brady Kachuk is a name that's been thrown out there a couple of times, mostly by the Cam and Stick podcast as well as the Spit and Chicklets podcast. It has been denied by Steve Steos of the Ottawa Senators, but at the same exact time, There's a little bit of smoke there. I'm not saying there's enough smoke to consider there to be actually a fire, but there's a lot of interesting names that the Penguins could get to be that top winger, to bump everybody down, to help them check off some of those names. The one thing I will say, though, if the Penguins go this route, which I don't think they will, I don't think for a second straight offseason they're going to go big game hunting like they did last offseason, Shana mentions the need for the Penguins to get more bottom six scoring. It's been a need for a long time for the Pittsburgh Penguins. It's been a need since, I mean, they got some in 2022. They immediately traded away, right? They had Evan Rodriguez chipping in in the bottom six. They had guys like Brandon Tanev, Zach Aston Reese, and Teddy Bluger. That line was very good for them and got completely dismantled that offseason. Jared McCann was on the team back then, or sorry, he was on the team that season or the season before that. I got to go back and actually remember when these players were shipped off, but McCann was around and the Penguins had some depth. But outside of that season, they've been struggling to find depth in the bottom six. If they go this route, they're not going to have a lot of money to figure out that bottom six. So you would imagine that that's where the young guys come into play. Vili Koivunen, can he make the jump to North America and be an impact player in year one? Vasily Ponomarev, he's in North America, but can he make that jump from an AHL talent to an NHL talent in one year. Does Braden Yeager get that opportunity? He's made a huge jump between his draft year and this past season, but can he make a similar jump next year and make it all the way to the NHL early in the season? There's a lot of question marks if you go this route for the bottom six scoring, but that's probably the route. If they decide to sign a Reinhardt, a Stamkos, trade for a Marner, they're probably going to go for the young guys in the bottom six and hope 
that they can catch on and get the Penguins to where they need to be with their depth scoring. And the other thing that Shana Goldman mentions is you need a bounce back season from Ryan Graves. He was at the very bottom of that list. If you're running it back with the top four, where there is a very good chance that they run it back with the top four on defense of Latang, Carlson, Pedersen, and Graves, you really need Ryan Graves to step up. Or you need, you see, Jack St. Ivany plays the right side, I'd say. Or you need Jack St. Ivany to take a step, but he's just not in the position on the Penguins roster to take a step and to be that guy that can go into the top four. I'll put the graphic up again. You have Ryan Graves right there at the bottom being that other top caliber defender to crush some soft minutes on the third pair. Now, Ryan Graves, him on the third pair with a Jack St. Ivany might be the best thing for him, but at the same time, then the Penguins are going to need to bring in a top four guy to play with Carlson or to play with Latang. Maybe it's P.O. Joseph. We heard that earlier this summer from Josh Yoe of The Athletic. Maybe it's just somebody else that can be a defensive defenseman in the top four and eat major minutes. But again, those players don't grow on trees. At the end of the day, I found it really interesting that that was the top need. That was the need that was talked about first. That was the need that when you look at that checklist for the Pittsburgh Penguins, that's the one that helps fill them out a little bit better. Because I do believe that the Penguins have way more areas of need. We started this episode talking about, hey, the power play needs to be figured out. That's not a personnel thing. That's just the people that are already in the organization need to figure it out. They need better defense whether that's going to be entrusting Ryan Graves and Eric Carlson to step up next season and have better years than they did Chris Letang potentially to stay healthy and stay at the level that he was at early in the season and Marcus Pedersen to continue to be the Marcus Pedersen that we've seen the last couple of seasons, not to mention Jack St. Ivany needing to take a step and needing to find somebody else to round out that six. It seems like with only $12.9 million in cap space, spending it all, on a top line winger just doesn't answer enough of the questions in my eyes for the Pittsburgh Penguins. Now, the last thing I'll say is she mentioned this as if the Penguins would keep everything else status quo. That would be the one thing that helps them. But when I look at this list of names, the top tier there was Crosby, Rust, Carlson, and Jari based on their actual categories. That second tier based on the categories is Malkin, Bunting, Ricard Raquel and Chris Letang. And the third tier is Riley Smith, Drew O'Connor, Marcus Pedersen, and Ryan Graves. Riley Smith's an interesting one because in her formula, you add a top line winger, Rust bumps down, Bunting bumps down, O'Connor bumps down, but you still have Riley Smith as one of your top six forwards in this exercise. I think there's a good chance Riley Smith is traded. So not only would you need to bring in one of these expensive, big name free agents or guys on the trade market, you'd also need to replace a guy like Riley Smith, who they're projecting to have the same exact impact next season as he did this season, which if you're the Pittsburgh Penguins, you need more from that much salary cap space. From $5 million, you need more. So you'd have to replace him in some way, shape, or form. And whether that's with somebody that's cheaper, whether that's with a young guy stepping up, you would not only need to add a guy at the top, but you would need to replace guys that you're sending out. Ricard Raquel is also a name that has not been you know, talked about without some trade rumors this offseason. So again, you might need to replace a guy like that. How active is Kyle Dubas this offseason? And how many of those holes does he need to fill? I think it's an interesting way to look at an organization. I think it's an interesting way to look at a team. And I think it raises a very important question, which is, will Kyle Dubas go for a big swing again in year two? He did that in year one with Eric Carlson trade. Whatever you think of Eric Carlson in and of itself, it was a big swing. It really put the Penguins down a path that if they want to switch, they have to pivot surrounding him and they can't pivot, pivot you know, including his cap space because he's not going to get traded. Are they going to do it again this offseason and further put themselves down that road? Because the acquisition cost for a Mitch Marner, for a Brady Kachuk, if, again, major if he is available, a Trevor Zegras, the acquisition cost is not going to be cheap. It might include a first-round pick. It might include one of those prospects 
that you're relying upon to be bottom six help next season. The acquisition cost for a Reinhardt, a Gensel, again, maybe, or a Stamkos, it's only salary cap space, but at the same time, how do you fill out the rest? If you trade Riley Smith, how do you fill out his position? If you trade Ricard Raquel, how do you fill out his position? The general theme of this article that she wrote in this little blurb about the Penguins was if you can get somebody at the top and put these other players in positions where they are better suited to succeed, Brian Russ not being the number one winger on the team, but being the number two winger on the team, he's in a better position to succeed. Same with Michael Bunting going from number two down to number three or four. He's in a much better position to succeed. Drew O'Connor being able to be a bottom six guy all season long. Same thing with about Terry Pustinen, who can be a bottom six guy all season long and mold and grow some chemistry with O'Connor and maybe Eller or maybe somebody else as a third line center. As a general concept, I like it. I like it a lot. Adding somebody at the top, trickling down the impact throughout the lineup is a good thing. But I do think that this team is too flawed for that to be the main turning point for this offseason, the main turning point for this organization as they try to bounce back and get themselves back into a playoff spot and then from there see what they can do. Because as we know, once they've gotten to the playoffs recently, they haven't had a lot of success. So I'm not going to say that they're going to make themselves Stanley Cup contenders because I don't think anything they do this offseason is going to make me say that they are an immediate Stanley Cup contender on day one of the 2024-25 season. But it was an interesting exercise. It's something that I want to go back to as the offseason progresses, as we see Kyle Dubas make some of these changes, as we see some of the names that were on that list get taken off and get replaced, and how the Penguins fare and how they stack up to the Stanley Cup formula of the last 13 seasons. I think it's a uh, certainly something that piqued my interest and I hope it piqued yours as well. But that's going to do it for this episode of Iceberg to Go. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Remember, you can find us on YouTube at Inside the Penguins or anywhere you get your podcasts from.